This is Bible Academy. Today we continue our study in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 4, B. We just got started on the first part of the verse last time. Now before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins, according to 1 John 1, 9, at the same time allowing the Spirit to control us. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and the privilege and everything you have provided so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds will be focused and open to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. I mentioned the word focus in the prayer because there's so much going on today in the world, uh, even in our cities and communities, that is a challenge to our concentration and our focus. So let's make sure that we keep our priorities right and spend our time in the Word of God. And this is particularly important in a book like this. And let me remind you that this is a difficult book. Not only is it difficult to interpret, it's full of important things that every believer ought to know. So it's also presented in a way that is advanced. I will go into detail and make sure that I clearly understand it, at least from the best I can do, and that you comprehend and try to remember what we're studying here because this is important. It has to do with a number of major doctrines, uh, major categories uh, that people would say in systematic theology and something we need to uh, learn well. Well, we're not going to repeat the prologue, which was in verses 1 and 2, so let's just begin by reading the beginning of this long sentence. Remember, it goes from verses 3 through 14 in the Greek, but we break it up into English to make it a little easier to handle. Verse 3, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. This starts out with a marvelous verse that God has given us each and every, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because our relationship with Christ. And then we saw that verse 4 begins the uh, study where the focus is on the Father and what he has done. Then later we'll do the Son and then we close this long sentence regarding the Holy Spirit. Now, we saw in verse 3 last time that the spiritual blessings of verse 3 begin with the choosing or election of the Father, that is, what the Father chose or elected to do. It also involved the redemptive price, which was the Son, and then we will see also later, sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So all three of these major concepts are in this one sentence. <clears throat> not only are these spiritual benefits in themselves, they are the basis for more to follow. So understand, each individual is chosen, selectivity, not at random, from the entire human race. Of course, this may be expanded in application to mean all believers, all believers are chosen, all united now as the church in the body of Christ so we can understand that we're also in the body of Christ as the universal church. Now, as we get into verse 4, <clears throat> we see uh, the verse itself, just as he chose us in him, that's in Christ. This is where we left off last time, so you should be familiar with everything I've pretty much talked about in the last few minutes. So again, each individual is chosen. There's a selectivity here. God did the choosing. Now, next phrase, before the foundation of the world. This is a way of saying before creation. Before creation, we were chosen. If I was to do a timeline, which I will, <clears throat> uh, let's see. I'll see if I can get it reasonably straight here. I don't have that little gizmo set up to Okay, so here is uh, when time began at creation. Okay. Well, 
according to Genesis 1. Okay, so we'll just say basically Genesis 1. We'll keep it simple here. We're not going to get into the gap theory and that type of thing right now. But uh, before creation, that is, the creation of heavens and earth, before God gave us time to basically run the creation, uh, the created heavens and earth, God, in eternity past, made decisions. Why I say eternity past, there's no time. There's no time back there. So just sometimes in the eternity past. God saw how you, all right, let's put you, it's not important at what time we put on this thing, but it, is the, it happened. You believed. He saw that you were going to believe. Okay. Now we get this from Romans uh, 8, uh, 29 primarily. <clears throat> it doesn't have that concept here in this particular verse, but the, the point is still true, of course that before the foundation of the world, you were chosen. God saw from eternity past that as he looked into the future with his foreknowledge, he saw you would believe. Therefore, he chose you from eternity past. He predestined you. You would be saved. All right. Let's talk about the word foundation for a moment before the foundation of the world. Now, the word foundation in the Greek has the idea of uh, you're going to start a crop. That's one way of looking at it. So you throw down the seeds, and that becomes your foundation. We wouldn't usually new, use the term in that way, but that's the idea of the word. However, we do see the word used in the creation of a building, like you would lay down stones. So that's the idea. For the Before the foundation of of the creation uh, of the world, that is, before the foundation of the world, okay? The word foundation is used frequently in Scripture, Matthew 13, 35, 25, 34, Luke eleven fifty, 50, Hebrews 4, 3, and so on. So we were chosen in Christ. Christ would go to the cross Sun time in history, we'll have to put him before our believing. So we'll just put the cross up here representing Christ going to the cross. Okay. He saw that you believe in Christ and he chose you. So we were chosen in Christ before creation. As I said, this is an eternity past before time and creation. Again, Paul doesn't mention the issue of foreknowledge. Let me just show you that portion of scripture in Romans. I'll just put 829a up there. Because whom he foreknew, these he also predestined. There you have it. That explains uh, how God could choose us, elect us, because he saw that we were going to believe. And we are chosen because our connection with Christ. Christ paid the price of redemption. We accepted that, and now as the redeemed God has us as his own. We are chosen for him. Look at the verse, first part of this verse. Just as he chose us in him. And now we add before the foundation of the world. Here he's just telling us that God chose us in him. That is Paul's writing. We are chosen because of our connection with Christ. The election of believers and the church preceded the foundation of of the world. Okay? So, not only are we chosen, but we were placed in, let's get this on the board too. Let's just write Christ. Christ is in the heavenlies right now, at the right hand of the Father. And let's just put a circle around him. We were chosen in him. We are now in Christ. We call this union with Christ, to get a little technical, but we are in Christ is the idea. We are associated with him in such a close way, another term is incorporated into him, also into his body. That's another way to put it, the body of Christ, the formation of the church. Purpose comes next in our verse. That we should be holy and blameless before him in love. I'll put the whole thing up there. Then we'll pick it apart. Okay. 
Let's talk about the word holy. We've already talked about it back in verse 1. Remember, the word is hagios. God chose us with the purpose of us being holy. It has to do with the word saint. Remember that? We studied in verse 1. It means set apart to God for his purposes. Set apart from the world as holy to God, though we're still in the world. So don't miss that part of this. We're to be holy in this unholy world. That's one of the purposes we were chosen. We're going to represent Jesus Christ on earth. And for that, we should be living, living holy lives. People occasionally make fun of Christians, calling them such names as Holy Joes or something along that line. But truly, we are to be holy. Now, let's make sure we understand that. It's not something to be made fun of. God is holy, both in the Old Testament, Leviticus 11.44, and the New Testament, 1 Peter 1.16, the believer is commanded to be holy because God is holy. Now, let's put this in relation to time. God did not choose us because we are holy or even want to be holy, but he chose us in order that we might be holy. We are to live up to the purpose for which we have been chosen. So this is something that every one of you should be, uh, uh, I should say, uh, probably the best word is convicted of. You are to be holy. Don't watch that. Don't do that. Don't say that. Don't listen to that. Okay? The other term is blameless. And blameless goes along well with holy. This word is um, excuse me, amomas, amomas, okay? Free from fault. Here, it's morally blameless. Let's talk about that for a moment. In the Old Testament system of worship, the animal offered was to be without blemish, okay? Exodus 29.1, Leviticus 1.3 and 4.3, and it's pretty much understood. Christ was offered as an unblemished sacrifice before God. Christ was unblemished. He was blameless. Hebrews 9.14, 1 Peter 1.19. Christ will present believers before God without blemish. Ephesians 5.27, Colossians 1.22, Jude 24. So one of these days, Christ present his uh, his bride, his body of Christ before God the Father as blameless. So our goal now in this life is to live blameless and holy lives. That way we live up to what Christ will present us to the Father as. Now, we're not going to live perfect lives. Of course not. But it is one of our constant goals set before us. And that is one of the standards by which we should live. We are to live blameless and without blemish before the unbeliever world, Philippians 2.15, Revelation 14.5. But here, the emphasis, notice, is before him. Before him. I really hope you have the opportunity to look at the board, because I'm going to be using it quite a bit here, as I have already. I'll continue to use it. Before him, that is, in his presence right now. Him, of course, is God the Father. Christ is the instrument through whose redemption God, God can bring the chosen into the presence of himself. So one more time. Christ is the instrument through whose redemption God can bring the chosen into the presence of himself. Christ's work made it possible. So now we should understand most all this sentence. We'll get to love in just a moment. Now, this goes back to the middle voice. Now, that means the verb is ek lego, all right? Uh, that goes back to uh, the being chosen, all right? God did the choosing, all right, himself, for himself, for his benefit, for the purpose that believers be holy and blameless before him. So this is all in God's plan. It's all what God wanted to do. It's for his benefit. He did the choosing. 
himself. At the same time, he did it for himself. And this is looking to the future when the believer is present before God. So we should be holy and blameless before him. And that refers to the future. At the same time, we're living that out right now according to other admonitions of Scripture. Final phrase. You'll probably find a lot of your translations don't put this final phrase here, but I think it works well. Love. We're going to talk about love for a while. A favorite topic of a lot of people, and then probably not a favorite topic of a lot of people. Love. Most of you are probably familiar with the Greek word. <clears throat> the verb, I'll put it up on the board. Uh, there's a couple ways I could do this. I'm just going to go from the standpoint of the verb, then we'll talk about the noun, which, of course, is related to the verb. We're going to talk about uses of this word agapao. Okay, agapao. Here we go. I'm going to put them up on the board and we can look at them for a few minutes. Uses of the word agapao and the New Testament. Now, your nouns come from your verbs. Okay, especially true in the Hebrew. I'm not sure if it's always true in the Greek. But we determine a meaning of a word through its usage. Okay, and that's why you have to look at the context. Number one, it's use of God's love within the Godhead. John 3.35, 14.31, Ephesians 1.6. You really want to get this well, look up those verses. You want to get it down well. You want to know it well. It's used of God's love within the Godhead. Two, God's love for human beings. Well, that's one we're pretty familiar with. John 14.21. Romans 8, 37, Galatians 2, 20, 2 Thessalonians 2, 16, 1 John 4, 10. Three, a human being's love for God. Romans 8, 28, important verse, by the way. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, 8, 3, Ephesians 6, 24, 1 Peter 1, 8, 1 John 5, 2. Human beings can love God, using the word agapao. Also, four, a human's love for other humans. That's a pretty obvious one, too. John 13, 34, 15, 12, Romans 13, 8 through 9, uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 11, 12, 15, Galatians 5, 14, Ephesians 5, 25, 28, 33, Colossians 3, 19, 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. I would suggest you look at least, look at several of these till you get it really down and understand its different uses. And then there can be human love for things. 2 Timothy 4, 8 and 10. God gives us some examples of his own love for one another. That is, from Ephesians 5 2. Okay, listen to this one. And walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Now, that might have thrown you when I gave you the heading to this. Let me read you the heading again. God gives us examples of his love. For one another. In other words, the examples are given to us in how we're to love one another. And the example is from God how he's loved the Son, or has, as, as Christ also loved you and gave himself. So the example is Christ. So we're given an example of Christ showing love, and it's sacrificial love, all right, and offering and a sacrifice to God. So we're to love each other just as Christ has shown love towards us and gave himself for us as a sacrifice. Other verses on that, 1 John 4, 7 through 12 and 16 through 18. So, I'm just going to say this. Have you got this down? You understand love. Do you understand agapao and several of its uses? I know it's difficult to remember these all the time, but if you go over them enough, you will be surprised perhaps how much you can remember these things and 
how some people will misuse these scriptures and misuse the word love, and you can explain, well, agapao doesn't mean that. It means this or this or this. Okay, a couple other ways. We still haven't really got to the de de uh, definition yet. We're just showing you some of its usages, okay? We know Paul teaches about this word akapao, describing it in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Several verses, remember about the gentleness and kindness and patience and these type of things. He goes into quite a bit of detail about the term helping to develop its standing, its understanding. Now, let me just mention this one. I think people have a curiosity about this. One of the words for love in the Greek literature, but it's not in the Bible, is eros, E-R-O-S. Now listen to this. Eros, one of the differences is, and we'll work on this a little bit more, is number one, it loves what is worthy. Uh, in other words, love is based upon how one evaluates what he's loving. Oh, I just love that house you live in. Oh, I just love your child. He's so nice. He's so kind. He's well-mannered, okay? Because he's worthy of that person's love. Or you might have a romantic notion of that. Boy, I really love the way she looks, the way she walks, okay? That type of thing. Another definition of eros it desires to possess this is where it often gets out of line uh, of course we get the word erotic eroticism terms like that but this word isn't in the bible and it's not agapao in fact agape which is the noun is in contrast to this on both of these points now listen to this agape the noun loves what is not worthy and it does not desire to possess. So it's not an essential that that particular thing or person has to be worthy of your love or that you have to have it. So agape love seeks to give. There's an aspect of it, an active aspect of it, regardless of the object's merit. A father loves his child. A kid's been awful lately. He's acted up. He's been rude. He's been mean. I've done everything I can to take care of him. But I'm still going to feed him, house him, clothe him, because I love him. He's mine, right? Now, let me help you out here. Agape is love with grace. Remember grace? Unmerited favor? It's love with grace. Now, in conclusion, both the verb and the noun, which is the basis for God's love for us, okay, agape, agapao, the noun, is extended to the undeserving, unworthy, even the unloving. No one would love them. God does. Like the sinner or backslidden believer. It seeks the highest good and the one loved. One more time. Both the verb and the noun, which is the basis for God's love for us, is extended to the undeserving, the unworthy, even the unloving. Remember, God loved us even while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. The unloving, like the sinner or backslidden believer, believers begin to turn away from God, God still loves them. That's why he disciplines them. It seeks the highest good in the one loved. Now, that means sometimes being honest with people uh, who really don't want to hear what you have to say. But if you love them, you'll tell them the truth. This is why we want to give people the gospel um, all the time if they need it. Now, that's a judgment call. In some cases, they're rejecting you, rejecting the gospel. I'm not saying be a hammer or be a nuisance, but... Uh, we still love them. We still want to see them saved, right? Even though they're unworthy. God did it. God does it. We can do it. Why? We have the Holy Spirit who, one of the fruits, is love. We can do that. 
He enables us to love the honest, meanest people. That doesn't mean we treat them like royalty, especially if they're criminals, right? But we do want them to have the gospel. That's one of the greatest things you can do for anybody, give them the gospel. Now, now that we have a good idea what the noun agape means, all right, we learned a lot from the verb, but basically it's what love is. It's loving something or someone even though they're unworthy of our love. We're going to talk about the words in love in love now first notice that some of the translations put this phrase with the next verse like the niv new american standard the uh, esv and thus say that it is very fitting to see god's presentation or predestination in love so they'll put it in the next phrase where it begins to talk about that that uh, predestination, all right? So that's one of the reasonings. And I'm not going to go into all the arguments back and forth. But there are good grammatical reasons not to translate it in that next verse. And it doesn't have to go that way. The Greek will certainly permit it to go the way we have it here in this verse. One does not need to show that God's choice is based in love. That is already known. So that's the argument, some of the basic arguments against translating it like the NIV and the New American Standard and ESV. ESV and NSV are very good translations, by the way. So just because you see something like this now, then you don't say, well, I can't use that one anymore. No, you'd be doing that back and forth with all the versions all the time if you really knew the Greek uh, or what it's really saying. Another view held by some translations the AV, that's the authorized version, the RV, the NRSV, and the Net Bible has it translated as I do in love, connected with this verse 4. Now, this view unites the phrase in love with holy and blameless. So what does that say? Look at it that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Now, in the present context, the verbs and participles describing God's actions always precede the qualifying phrases, and for it to modify predestined is inconsistent with the rest of the context. So what does this mean? All right, I know that's technical, and you might want to look into it if you want to go deeper, but, but just understand there's good reasons to place it uh, in a position that I did. Now, so what does it mean? First, the word love here has to do with human love, as we have it in Ephesians 4, 2, and 15, 16, and 5, 2. Secondly, holy and blamelessness in love shows, here's, here's our point, that the motivation of the believer to live holy and blameless is born out of love. You see, there's a personal interest in loving God and living for Him. Isn't it true? If you love someone, you will try to please them? All right? As long as they're doing the right thing and it's for the right reason, right? All right, if your wife says, uh, I want you to drive the getaway car while I rob that bank, uh, no. Okay, that's not in their best interest. But this shows us that if we have a personal interest in loving God, we're going to show it. Other scriptures say terms like obedience. You're going to go be obedient. You show your love for God by being obedient. Here is talking about our way of life we will live a holy and blameless life. So people who uh, write and say, well, I just love God, yet they live in a disobedient life, they don't understand what love is. Or they don't live a holy life. Or they don't seek to be blameless in their activity. Often the fatal flaw in that is they don't understand what it means to be controlled by the Spirit, even though they're believers. So they try to do it out of the flesh, and you can't. Okay, there I just got into a 
a can of worms there, but that's very true. You cannot live the Christian life unless you understand how to live by the Holy Spirit. He's given to us to enable us to live by the Holy Spirit. And when we do that, we show our love for God. So, let's get this all to fall in together here. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in his presence right now in love because we love God. Now, at the same time, that love is really, I mean, I did say we we respond to God in love, but this holy and blameless also means before mankind. All right? In love. We're not going to offend people, all right, intentionally. That is, there are some times you're always going to offend people, even if you just speak the truth, okay? But we don't go up and say rude things. We see uh, that uh, situation demands the truth. We give them the truth. It may seem offensive to them. The disciples talked about Jesus <laughs> regarding that. If you say that, you're going to offend them, Jesus. Well, of course. So let's don't make the exception the rule, Okay. We show our love for people by living holy and blameless around them so they can accuse us of anything. Now, that's one of the big challenges in the Christian life, to live holy and blameless. Okay. Verse 5. Okay, let me just pick up with verse 4 again, that we should live holy and blameless for him in love, having predestined us to adoption of sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. See how this this one sentence just goes into one major issue after another. Now we talk about predestination again. Having predestined, okay, our word pro orizo to means to decide beforehand. Predetermine. The thought is that the choosing and the predestination happened contemporaneously, the way this is in the Greek uh, verb setup. Let me just put it that way. He chose us because he predestined us. Okay? Explained that in the chart a moment ago. Uh, he chose us, that in turn predestined us, if it's still up there for us. Okay? So, he chose us in the past. All right, this is actually when he chose us. It's also when he predestined us. From his foreknowledge, we saw he sees us believing. Okay, he says, oh, he believed in Jesus Christ. All right, now he's one of the chosen. So, he's going to be predestined. God saw all of this. You know, God knows everything from the beginning to the end. In our life, in, in earth's creation, But he also knows everything about everything without time. That was a mind boggler, isn't it? So he chose us because he predestined us. So that's basically what this is saying. He predestined us to adoption as sons. So we're chosen, we're predestined. Got it? Go back to our previous verse. Just as he chose us in him, on and on, until we say, having predestined us to adoption. So we predestined to what? To adoption as sons. Very important and interesting word. I'll spend some time on this. You get it down really well. You get, you know, it kind of has a story to it. People like stories. Let's talk about this, to adoption as sons. In other words, this is a way of saying to sonship. How he made us a son. Or uh, a daughter. But sonship covers both, okay, the way this is used. First word, to, indicates direction or appointment. All right, this tells us what God's uh, intention was, which here is sonship. To be appointed to sonship means to adopt. So we have this translation. I want to make that clear. To be appointed to sonship, or, uh, or as I have up here, to adoption as sons. Now, in the Old Testament, there's very little about adoption. So it really doesn't help us 
on this. No Israelites were adopted into a different family or God's family for that matter. Like we have it in Paul, with Paul in the New Testament. So it's really the New Testament where we become aware of this. Now they had some things going on back there, but we wouldn't really call it adoption. Uh, the Jews did not have a legal code for adoption. However, there are scriptures that almost say that. God does not bring Israel, excuse me, God does bring Israel to be the sons of God. Deuteronomy 14.1, Isaiah 39, but the technical term adoption isn't there. We also know of the Davidic covenant where God says, in 2 Samuel 7, 14, I will be his father and he will be my son. In a sense, though, uh, it does seem that all Israel is adopted as a child of God. So we have a very limited understanding of adoption in the Old Testament. The real heavy understanding comes with Paul. All right. And Paul uses Roman law. That's what's in mind in the background here. It's not Old Testament background. It's Roman law and practice when it came to adoption as sons, because they did it in Rome, clearly. And he uses that Greek word. The Greek word, did I show that already? Yes, I did. Let me just put it up there again for you. Huyothesia means adoption of sons. Now let's talk about this. The Christians lived in Roman times and under Roman law, so they understood adoption. The practice of adoption was used by the Caesars for succession of power, so the people would have familiarity with the term. Oh, he's, son, he's, uh, he's adopted by Caesar. That's pretty important. But to appreciate adoption, we need to have something uh, some understanding of the Roman family structure. So here's a little story, but it's not simple. In Rome, in their culture, the father had absolute power over the family. The, uh, the Latin word, which is what the Romans spoke basically, patria potestas. He had full legal ownership of everything the family had. And he could get rid of it as he wanted. All right, he had that kind of authority. Again, the patria potestas had full legal ownership of everything the family had and could dispose of it as he wanted. Now, if you want to adopt a son, let's say you didn't have a, 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 a male son, you see someone you want to adopt, and he's in another family. All right, here's what has to happen. First, the son had to be released from the natural father. The father says, okay, you can adopt him. So they had to go through a procedure. After a procedure in which, it's a little hard to follow, the natural father sold him as a slave three times. All right, that means three times the amount of a slave. He sold him three times, selling him taking him back twice, he's yours, he's back to me, he's yours, you're back to me. And each time the, uh, the one who adopting, who was doing the adopting had to keep buying him. But on the third sale, we move to a second phase or second step where the adopting father kept him this time. There's no selling him back. And he came under the adopting father's control until the son died or freed him from that control. Of course, if he died, you know he'd be free from it or the father died, okay? Now, I think that specifically had to do with the father dying, but obviously the son would be out under his control, okay? So the newly adopted son was only responsible to his new father at this point. He didn't answer to his natural father anymore which also means he could even continue the family line and maintain property ownership. I try to remember if they actually did this in Ben-Hur, that he was adopted. Seems like he was, but I can't remember the movie well enough to, to, to confirm that. But 
the idea was that one of the senators or something adopted him and, and he became his adopted son. Therefore, he would uh, uh, take over the family and the property and everything, basically, because he had become the next generation, patria potestas. Okay? Now, with all of that in mind, this is good stuff, I think, the saint, the believer, is predestined as adopted sons and daughters. When I say sons, just remember daughters is included females too, of God, and you become children of God with the privileges of an adopted child. Now, you don't go up to own everything that God the Father owns. Of course not. But you do have the privileges, privileges of an adopted child. Okay? So I just want to show you that uh, Roman system to show this is what uh, Paul is playing off of here. This is the background. Later in Ephesians, Paul writes that believers were sons of disobedience and children of wrath. That's in Ephesians 2, 2 and 3. But now as believers, and listen to this, we have no obligation to their former father. Believers have no obligation to their former father. Who's that? the prince of the power of the air. Of course, you don't answer the devil, but he's the one who wants rule over you. We are now under the rule of God. He controls, listen, our lives and our property. By the way, God will never die, so we'll always be in the status of a son. Got it? And that will always be the case. God is eternal. He gives us eternal life. He is always the Father. And by the way, I might add, as the Father, he has the right to discipline us, especially uh, since we're on earth still. He'll do that here on earth. Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. Keep in mind that the purpose of adoption in Rome was to continue the family line. They have a new status with privileges and an inheritance. Whoa, that comes in later. Being adopted to God has all advantages, has every advantage you can imagine. Plus, we have a loving, almighty, I like to throw that in now and then, letting people know that God is powerful enough to do whatever he wants. He's merciful and perfectly just. He will always do what is best for his sons and daughters. And I just reminded you, including discipline. Let's look at another verse, Romans 8.23. Romans 8.23 on the board. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Now, what is this talking about? This is really talking about phase two of our adoption when we get our new bodies. And we dump this old earth body with its sinful nature and move into eternity and our eternal bodies. So we go to another experiential level with adoption at our resurrection. But understand right now, the fact that we have went through phase one of adoption, our old father, the devil, has no authority or rights to us as believers. We are saints. We are set apart unto God. We will never come under the authority of the devil again. That is, as we are believers, as we continue to believe. Now, from our verse 5, Continue on. We have been adopted as sons, okay, having predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. The adoption is through Christ. It is by the means of the work of Christ, as we see in the following verses, that made this possible for us to become members of the family of God that made it possible for us to be adopted. And notice, 
to himself. Now, there's some disagreement over if this is to Christ himself or to the Father himself. I think it's the Father because the Father is the one who's uh, most likely here because the context keeps referring to the Father and what he's doing with the Son. Okay? So it's more likely God the Father than the Son here because the context is referring to the Father. And in verse 4, it is a Father doing the choosing to be holy and blameless before him. Okay? So, through Jesus Christ to himself, which is the Father. And notice this will happen according to the good pleasure of his will. What does that mean? Now, here's something I want you to remember. I remember this a long time ago from, from, way, from teenage years, you might say. When my pastor used to translate the word according to, he'd say, kata, that's the Greek word, kata, according to a normal standard. He'd say that over and over and over and over. So you know that when it says according to something, I think that means it has to be, uh, the, the condition is it has to be in the accusative, as I recall. But it means normal standard, according to, normal standard, according to, normal standard. So when we say according to, we'll see this again and again in Scripture. The good pleasure of his will. The standard is the good pleasure of God's will. That's what he wanted to do. This tells us what God wanted to do. And what else about it? According to the good pleasure. According to the good pleasure of his will. It pleased him to do this. The word for good pleasure let me show you that. Eudokia, desire, is good pleasure. That's it. That it was God's desire. Until I get a little bit excited about this, because this is just wonderful. This is, this is about as good as it can get when you're going to go into the mind of God and see what he's done for us. This is great stuff. It tells us that God enjoys giving things to his children. It is God's sovereign will. It's his desire. It pleases him. All part of the plan to adopt us. He wanted to adopt us. It pleased him. He did it. Now let me give you a summary conclusion. God predetermined our adoption into the family of God. He did this through his son, Jesus Christ. This was all done according to his pleasure. It was a pleasing action to God to adopt us and to his family. What does that tell you? He wanted us. He loved us. We know that. Look to the extent. Look at the extent to which he went to bring us into his family. This goes back to being one of those spiritual blessings that we give him the praise for. Verse 6 gives us the goal, in other words, uh, about what the Father's doing. Now we have the goal. Now we're going to see the goal with what the Son does in verse 12 and the Spirit in verse 14. So we have these um, phrases that last uh, several um, phrases, I should say, large phrases within this sentence. Okay, Verse 6, here's the goal. To the praise of the glory of his grace, with which grace he has bestowed on us in the beloved one. Now, we've talked about a number of these terms over and over, so we should pretty much understand what this means. But before we get into the detail, I just want to point out again, this verse ends the first part of this long Greek sentence, what we'll just call, uh, instead of phrase, let's use the word strophe. Okay, that's more the technical Greek term. The first strophe of praise. Thus, I'm going to put a period in, which I did. Okay, so here's the goal of the first strophe. Again, remember, this part emphasizes God the Father. Now that we've seen the Father's activity, including the choosing and all the things we saw, we now see it comes to a goal. That goal, verse 6, to the praise of his glory, of his grace, of the glory of his grace. Praise. Remember, we've studied that. 
This is a word, though, that we haven't seen yet. It's not the typical one we see for praise. It's the same as blessed. It's ipinos. This word actually has emphasis on approval or recognition. To the recognition of the glory, common word we've seen many times, uh, doxa. Now, let's talk about glory for a moment. Glory, or doxa, is the condition of being bright or shining. Brightness, splendor, radiance. Now, how does that relate to God? Because glory is the reflection of God's essence. That's why you will see people uh, bow down in his glory. They can't look at his glory. Uh, it's blinding, all these things. It's God's essence is so uh, great. How do you say that? It's so marvelous. It's so magnificent. It's bright. It's radiant. Uh, some of the angels, you'll see them in glory. Or a human may reflect something of their own essence, and they'll say, the glory of that man is this. That is glory. It includes the idea of power, splendor, and reputation. So understand glory is a reflection of God's essence. And we can glorify God in the sense of praise or magnify him because of his glory, the reflection of his essence. Remember that. Glory is a reflection of his essence. So we give God the glory. We're basically giving back what he gives us. He shows us his glory and his works and his deliverance and his provision. We give glory to him. We show people, we tell people he is magnificent and give him the glory. He is the one that deserves all glory. Now, I know that's a little difficult to grasp, but just keep thinking about it, working on it. Uh, start giving glory in your in your uh, prayers. Uh, you are worthy all. You are worthy of all glory, God of all praise. Everything we can give back to Him, He's worthy of it. Now this says the glory of His grace, one of the major manifestations of God's character towards us. We discuss the word grace in verse two. Again, God's undeserved and unmerited favor. It's basic to both salvation and the enablement of the believer. We can do things because of God's grace. Now, carrying forward the thoughts of the previous verses, this is saying that there should be praise towards God, his essence, his glory, for his grace when he chose us or predestined us. So now the good reason to praise him. We praise him for his grace. His grace was manifested towards us. It reflected, it was radiated towards us in his choosing us. In other words, God's glory is seen in his actions of grace when he chose and adopted believers as sons and daughters into the family of God, and we should praise his glory, which demonstrated grace in his choosing. You get that? Let's look at the board for a moment. So here we have God. I'm going to practice uh, illustrating this. God's glory, which reflects his essence. His essence, and we've talked about that many times, not only all of his uh, essential characteristics, his, his uh, goodness and his, his mercy and his, his almighty, he's almighty, he's all-knowing, uh, he sees everything, he's every place, and so on and so on. He's perfect truth, integrity, and so on. But this reflects in his glory. All right? And one of the manifestations of that is grace. So we see glory in grace. Okay? That's a G. <laughs> okay? With which grace, notice, he has bestowed on us. Listen, listen to this. The word bestowed. Now, I use that kind of an old word to show you something. Karitao. To cause to be the recipient of a benefit. That's why I like the word bestow. It's kind of unique. Bestow favor on. 
with which grace he has bestowed on us. He has given this to us. It is grace that's been bestowed on us. So, go back to our verse, to the praise of the glory of his grace, with which grace he has bestowed on us. He's given us grace. Uh, it's like being chosen to be adopted as sons. All right. Now, it goes on to say, and the beloved one. And the beloved one. Of course, that's Christ. Now, some of your verses may not even have this on there. I'm not sure. I haven't I have to check on that. But sometimes they want to take these kind of phrases into the next uh, verse. But anyway, so here's what we're saying. The word beloved is the noun agape. All right? And in this context, it would refer to Christ. And notice it says in. In the beloved one. In Christ. In the beloved one. So he has bestowed on us in the beloved one. Beloved one is only used as a title for Christ in this New Testament verse. However, it's similar to other phrases we've studied, like beloved son that the Father calls Jesus at his baptism, Matthew 3, 17, and the, and the transfiguration, Matthew 17, 5. I haven't studied Matthew with you, but uh, that hopefully that's coming up maybe this year. Beloved one indicates the Father's love for him, and as believers in Christ, we are also objects of that love. This is similar to and like being in Christ and the beloved one. So we're seeing more spiritual blessings as we see here this grace being bestowed on us. God's grace towards the believer is seen over and over again in this letter. We just saw it in his election, his redemption, his forgiveness, verse 7, his salvation, we'll see it in 2, 5, and 8, the kindness expressed in Christ in 2, 7, the inclusion of the Gentiles to the family of God, to the church, uh, that's 3, 1 through 2, all in Ephesians, Paul's calling in ministry, 3, 7, and 8, gifts given to the church in 4, 7. Okay, let's read verses 4 through 6. These are what we study today. Just as he chose us in him before foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, with which grace he has bestowed on us in the beloved one. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are amazed at the wonderful things you have given us, how you have predestined us and put us in your plan to adopt us into your family, bestowed grace on us because of your Son, because of allowing us to believe in him, giving us that free will, and thereby choosing us to be used by you. Challenge us of what we've heard today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.